Hi everybody, um, welcome to Solus Nua. My name is Miranda Driscoll. I'm the Interim Executive Director of Solus Nua. Um, we are a multidisciplinary arts organization based in Washington DC um, and we present the best of contemporary Irish arts to US audiences. So um, welcome to the third part of Is It About a Bicycle, which is um, a new series in association with Global Irish Studies program at Georgetown University. And uh, any of you Flan O'Brien fans out there may recognize the title as a quote from The Third Policeman, which is a, um, a novel by Flan O'Brien, a very uh, absurd, meandering, wonderfully funny tale um, about time, death, and just the bizarreness of, of human existence. So. <laughs> No pressure, that's our starting point. But um, no, the, the series essentially is titled that because it brings um, it brings Irish and Ireland based writers together with um, artists and um, working in other disciplines and um, leaders and experts in other fields and sectors to talk about some of their shared interests. So um, a bit about, a bit like the, the title, I suppose these conversations are invited to go anywhere really and be about anything, but essentially the starting point is always one piece of writing or book. Um, so um, in this case, I'm delighted to welcome um, Dublin writer Christine Dwyer Hickey, who will be in conversation with visual arts curator Leo Mazow. Um, and the starting point for the conversation is going to be Christine's very wonderful novel, uh, The Narrow Land, which was published in 2019. And it's a historical fiction um, about the artist Edward Hopper and his wife Josephine Hopper. Um, so that's really our, our starting point. Just a little bit about both of our speakers today before I hand over to them. So Christine Dwyer Hickey is a novelist and a short story writer. She's published eight novels, a short story collection and a full length play. Um, her short stories have been published in anthologies and magazines worldwide and have won several awards. Um, the latest novel, as mentioned, The Narrow Land, published by Atlantic UK, was the 2020 winner of the Walker Scott Prize um, for historical fiction and was also the winner of the inaugural Dawkey Literary Awards in 2020. Um, Dr. Leo Mazo is the Louise B. and J. Harward Cochrane Curator of American Art at the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts. He is the contributing editor of Picturing the Banjo and the author of Thomas Hart Benton and the American Sound, uh, which won the Eldridge Prize for Outstanding Scholarship in American Art. Um, he's held a Paul Mellon Senior Visiting Fellowship at the Centre for Advanced Study in the Visual Arts at the National Gallery of Art, where he began his book project, um, Edward Hopper and the American Hotel, which also uh, was an exhibition at the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts in 2019 and 20. So this is the catalogue essay, a catalogue um, uh, the exhibition catalogue and it's a really beautiful, um, quite a tome of uh, gorgeous essays and, um, and images about Edward Hopper and the hotel. So two very different um, sort of perspectives on, on Hopper uh, coming from two very different directions. So I hope you'll enjoy it. The event will be about an hour. Um, if you do have any questions, we really uh, encourage you to pop them in the Q&A. The chat will be disabled, but please um, put questions in at any point um, and we'll do our best to get to them at the end. So just uh, to thank Colleen Parsons from Global Irish Studies at Georgetown, um, Megla Sridhar, who is looking after us today on Zoom, um, and to our two speakers, Christine and um, Leo, and enjoy the event. Thank you. Okay, M Miranda, thank you very much. Can everybody he hear me? Christine, do you hear me? Okay. I can hear you. Yeah, can you hear me? I am really honored to be asked to hold uh, an interview, to be in conversation with Christine Dwyer Hickey, uh, the author of not just Taddy, Cold Eye of Heaven, and other books you all know, but this outstanding volume, which if you haven't read it, I highly recommend it. Um, uh, I would go so far as to call it an 
an important critical intervention into the genre of historical fiction. When you hear the phrase historical fiction, something may come to mind. Um, I bet this is not it though. So I, I want to thank Miranda Driscoll and Solas Nua. Nua. I'm sure I'm mispronouncing that and the people at Georgetown and others for hosting this and um, in this series of which this is part. And I wanna say a few words before um, really getting into the meat of this and what it's all about with Christine. But first a few words about the Hoppers. Um, Edward and Josephine Hopper, she's called Jo, uh, their lives overlapped in many, many ways. They were both born around the same time. He lived from 1882 to 1967. She, Jo Hopper, uh, was born the following year, 1883, and passes away right after he does in 1968. Most of us probably know Hopper for the oft-reproduced painting Nighthawks, uh, which is in the Art Institute of Chicago. Uh, many American museums, several European museums, have work by this artist who um, uh, is one of the best known American artists, certainly in the 20th century and, uh, and past and present. He's pretty canonical. He exhibited in the Armory Show in 1913, which was the introduction, really the first institutional introduction of American art, uh, of mo modern art in the United States. Didn't sell much work though in those er early years. He mostly made a living early in his career as a printmaker, but especially as an illustrator for popular and trade literature. Um, the Hoppers lived in a rented studio apartment on the sixth floor of a walk-up building at 3 Washington Square North. Uh, where they live is presently the NYU School of so Social Work, which also serves as Edward's studio beginning in 1913. Um, so as some of you know, but not enough, enough of us realize, Joe Hopper was an artist. Uh, she was absolutely an artist. It would not be an exaggeration to say she put her work and other aspects of her being on hold to facilitate his career. Most of her work, a lot of his, her work has been thrown out uh, destroyed, only a few examples survive. And much of Christine's book, in fact, deals with the, you know, it's historical fiction, but there's a real nonfiction element, I have to say, uh, of uh, interchange as having to do with her own quest for autonomy, for her own voice to be, be heard, which really just sings out here. Um, so after the Hopper's marriage in 1924, uh, and as you can do the math here, they both, they married somewhat later in life. Joe also lived and worked there, although the couple acquired a larger apartment on the front side of the same floor in 1932, allowing both Joe and Ed artists their own workspace. In those early years, they usually spent their summer months traveling in New England in search of subject matter. But by 1930, they began renting summer cottages in South Truro on Cape Cod. The couple eventually brought property there in the fall of 1933 and built their own cottage there they would vacation in for the rest of their life in 1934. And this is the setting. This. South Truro, Massachusetts on Cape Cod, the, that narrow land, that narrow strip of land is the setting for so much of this not novel. Um, and so Christine, you not unlike myself um, in, in, in my work, but we, it sounds like we both very much relied on the diaries of uh, Edward Hopper uh, people who have published the diaries, people like Gail Levin. But to go back a little bit, can you tell me, before getting into the novel, can you tell me what it is about the Hoppers? I assume 
that this is the first time you've really written about visual artists, at least at this length. What is it about the Hoppers uh, and their life on South Truro that, that appealed to you? Well, it was a very gradual process, Leo. I didn't set out to write about the Hoppers. I never wanted really to write about people who existed. I find that whole idea sort of, well, I was always a little bit snooty about people who did that. And even about biography sometimes, because when people are no longer with us and they cannot um, defend themselves or they cannot speak up for themselves, I find a lot of this, a lot of work, but whether it's biographical or whether it's, um, you know, fictionalized, can be full of supposition. And I, and I always try to avoid that. So where might you ask what was I doing writing a whole novel about one of the best known couples in, um, in American art, um, in the world of American art? Uh, the novel really started with Michael, who is a German refugee boy of 10 years of age. It started with him and a chance trip to Truro uh, on, uh, on the narrow land gave me the location. And at that point I thought the Hoppers could have a little cameo role on the side of a dune or something painting and that Michael, my little refugee boy, would see them. And then a few things intervened in my life um, and uh, it, I was brought to the Hoppers, to, into their marriage through um, uh, a, a documentary that I saw on TV that I had recorded. Uh, I don't know whether you want me to, tell, to go into all this or not, but mm. anyway, I, I went to the Cape, Cape Cod the first time. I knew that the little boy was in my, had been in my mind for five years. And I had heard about him from a, a German translator when I was on tour in Germany. And he told me that after the war in Germany, uh, he was one of the children who suffered from extreme um, malnutrition and was sent off on a train to a farm to sort of be fattened up and then sent on to be, hopefully to be adopted maybe to America. And the, the thoughts of a little boy sitting alone with other children, none of whom he would have known in patched up uh, uniforms belonging that had been cleaned up and patched up from dead soldiers, that stuck in my head and it stayed there for quite some years. And um, then when I got to Cape Cod, and most people, my idea of Cape Cod up to that had been an association with the Kennedys, you know, all glamour and yachts and all that stuff. But when I got to Truro, it's really, really very um, deserted and there's something otherworldly about it. There's hardly anybody around. It's a really kind of a little, a little oasis in the middle of all that between Provincetown and the more glamorous end of, uh, of, uh, of the Cape. But um, I knew by the light, I was struck by the light. I was struck by, by as I said, another worldly aspect of it. And I knew I wanted that to be my location. And that's all I had. So I came home to Dublin, started the first chapter, had Michael on the train, had him just about to get off the train. And I was diagnosed with cancer of the kidney. And I had to go into hospital. And quite, it all happened very quickly to have my kidney removed. So I had a long drawn out um, recovery and an insomnia set in. And I used to come down to the, where we have the TV in the sitting room and lie on the sofa feeling sorry for myself and turn on the TV. And I came upon this um, recording of the documentary called Edward Hopper and the Blank Canvas. And I watched it for about five minutes, fell asleep. Next day, and that was the first sleep I'd had in about three months. Next day, I did the same thing, but the time I stayed awake grew longer. But at the same time, in this documentary, you could hear his voice speak, and you could hear Joe speak, and you could hear the sea move and the sound of music. And, you know, there, I just somehow entered their marriage. And as I recovered, I knew that the Hoppers were now going to muscle in on the novel, and I was now going to have to write about them. So that's how that started. But it wasn't an intentional thing. I was no more than an admirer of his paintings at that point. Right. So it all began with My Michael, the sense. It all began with Michael, yeah. There's right. always one thing that starts a novel and then something adds to it and then something adds to it and suddenly you're on a roll and there's no getting off. So 
your version of Joe, Joe mm. Hunter, elaborates on, and to some extent, conventional histories of her, but it's very mm. believable because it follows what we do know of her professional frustration, yeah. her relationship with Edward, as well as her adorable quirks, if that doesn't sound pat patronizing. What do you want audiences to know about Joe? Well, I don't really want them to know anything. For me, it was an exploration um, of her character that, that slowly evolved. Uh, I started out sort of disliking her. I thought she was a piece of work. I thought she was very demanding. And um, then I uh, gradually got to like her and pity her as the novel went on. Um, yeah. Leo, you're gone from my view. Sorry about, about that. That's okay. And um, I, I kind of got to know her, but I did try to use, you know, known facts or almost facts and then elaborate on them. And I did want people to, to, I suppose, I wanted myself to look inside her frustration and her anger and her, you know, her ambition too, I think was overlooked, that she was really quite ambitious. Um, she was highly intelligent, but maybe a little bit pretentious, I found in her conversation about art anyway. Whereas he seemed to be the opposite. He, he seemed to be very reluctant to talk about art but she would talk about, about her, her, her work all the time. And I don't think she was behind the door about promoting herself, but it just didn't happen for her. It, that's the opinion I got. But I also felt that one of the things that interests me about her is that very early on, I learned that she lost both her father and her brother to what was known as dipsomania, alcoholism, as we would call it now. And so she was the adult child of an alcoholic and probably one of the worst examples of such in that she had a lot of the traits that are common. And I can say this because I'm also an adult um, child of alcoholics and a lot of people are, of course. But um, one of the things is insecurity. And she was extremely insecure. And, uh, and there was a bitterness and an anger and a kind of a paranoia as well. Uh, so I thought she was a very interesting character, a feminist, an early feminist from, uh, in the modern sense, but hated women, which was kind of funny. She didn't seem to have any time for any women and quite often blamed female artists as well for her or anybody who had any say in how she might get on as an artist, uh, blamed them on her lack, of, um, her lack of success in her lifetime. You know, she's a very complex character. One of the one of the really most difficult parts in, in a in a, a volume full of some tough passages, I found one of the most difficult parts. Edward's receipt of the long-awaited letter from his dealer Frank Ray, mm -hmm. whom he, at her insistence, had written to see if he could find a gallery, an exhibition space. And you really know how to twist the knife in that. You let that go on for a while, um, coming to a climax of sorts with the flicking off of it into the, you know. Yeah. Um, and then when she, at the very, towards the end, I suppose, she, she calls him on it. She puts two and mm. two together. That was a tough part. That, that really, at the same time, though, I have to say that, I mean, one of the things I kept thinking of in reading the book is, when, so when I first started doing research on Hopper, I heard this, all this stuff about kind of this received wisdom that Joe is jealous. Mm. Oh, jealous Joe. And I realized what a sexist trope that had mm. in fact become. And in reading your, he may have been jealous, but it wasn't just you know, of other, what I was always told, well, well, that's why he wouldn't let him, you know, she wouldn't let him have other mo mo models. Be that hmm. as it may, you know, what is she jealous of? Is it, is it just the women in the Kaplan household? The Kaplans, for those of you who haven't read this, the Kaplans, Michael, I guess I should let you as the author really get, get this straight, but the Kaplans are a family with a nice property, 
on Cape Cod in, in Truro, Michael, the adopted son sent by this orphanage agency to New York has been shipped off for the summer to hang out with Mrs. Kaplan's grandson, Richie, who has lost a father in the war. But getting back to Joe, maybe the Joe you present, she doesn't like Hopper ogling over Olivia or Catherine later, but what she really doesn't like is not being a part, not having her voice heard. Yeah, she wants to be very much part of everything. That's, this is the impression I got. Like, who knows? None of us were there. We have to guess. And uh, she did appear to me to very much want to be part of his work and his life. And to, you know, one person who was there, and I did pay attention to uh, some of his writings and also um, a documentary, a film documentary that he'd made um, on the subject of Brian O'Doherty. And I think that, um, you know, I think Hopper, for example, was more social than a lot of us, more sociable than a lot of us would have thought. And I think that even though she wrote about needing company and not being like him, wanting to be alone on a hillside for the whole summer, every summer, I also think that in a way she wanted people, she wanted him to herself. She was quite possessive of him. And she was jealous of just his place in the world his interior life, the fact that she was left, left out sometimes from it. And as I said, she's complex. You just don't, it's very hard to pin down what it was. She was torn between hugely admiring his work and having knowing in her heart, because she was a very intelligent woman, that no matter how hard she worked and even no matter what opportunity she came, she would be always looked upon as someone in his shadow. And um, society will do that, not just herself, because I do think, in fairness to Edward Topper, that compared to other men of his time, he, he tried to help her. And he did try to honor her um, right to, to paint and to, to have a space to paint in. And, you know, like people don't, often don't realize that he actually did a lot of even the housework and the, the shopping and the cooking and that kind of thing. And for a man who was born in the 1880s, that in that, and living in this, you know, the book is set in 1950, it was unusual. You know, it was unusual, I think. Um, I don't know, I still can't figure Joe out. I'm still trying to figure her out, you know? <laughs> you may say that, but I, but, I, but I have to say, Christine, that um, although this is historical fiction, I put post around fiction. Sorry, but um, it really you you bring us into some you bring us into the weeds on some things that give this such an air of veracity that most of this struck me as very plausible. One device that you used that I thought was very good is you used the ledger books that the Hoppers kept. It was uh, the Hoppers, many of you may know this, they, um, for every, not every work, but in his mature career, Edward Hopper's career was, there was an entry in a financial ledger book that, um, that Joe made. I think it was all Joe's notes, except for certain annotations about color by Hopper. And you probably have one of the, yeah, yeah, yeah. and a little a little um facsimile drawing by mm. uh, but, you know for example can you see this yes absolutely. yeah that's one of the paintings i use and then we have here the little stamp that he made the little drawing he did and then her notes underneath right but apparently she changed now and then to become more involved with so yeah i did use that a lot well that really shows I mean, Joe is in some ways, she's been called a certain gatekeeper for him. Mm. She knows how they're made and she's the one, as you have in your book, reminding him that he owes a painting to his dealer. She's the not so silent collaborator. And um, mm. what I think is strong about your work 
is that it doesn't just acknowledge her omission from the canon, it attends to the terms of that omission. Mm -hmm. and, it, and it brings us in away from the hero worship of him and into the more prosaic details of her, of her life. Another thing I'd like to ask you to talk about is to address the conscience and the ethics of the Joe Hopper that comes out in The Narrow Land. You have one of the most charming, and I hope it's not weird to hear me say that, um, I don't think I've ever called Edward Hopper charming, but <laughs> Hopper, Ed and Joe come alive in the presence of these two kids. Yeah. They express themselves. Do you want to talk about a little bit about their fondness for children and how you came to... Yeah, how I came to think that. Um, well, I think, first of all, um, you know, as you do research, you're struck by an occasional thing which will, will you know, germinate and become an idea and you work on with that. But um, one of the things was that Joe always said that Edward didn't like kids. He didn't want kids. He didn't like kids. And this was her, this was the official um, line. And yet then some other people said that when he came to visit them, he always played with the kids and he, he had fun with the kids and he could be great fun with children. So that was one thing that kind of stuck in my head. And another one was the language that she used around her paintings, because she also said that she didn't want kids. Kids got in the way of your career, you know, as, as an artist and all that. But she, all, she talked about her, his, his paintings as being there at the conception. And she talked about them almost like they were children. And she referred to her paintings as her stillborn bastards. Right. And so that kind of language seemed very unusual to me, you know, yeah. it, it almost portrayed something in her. So I started to think that children could change their life. And it was also something to do with the two boys, to bring them into this, um, to, to bring them together, to make these little sort of groups like Edward took to the American boy, Richie, who was excessively polite, but very, very lonely, a very lonely child. He'd lost his father, but Michael had also lost his father, a German soldier. They both lost fathers on, um, on opposite sides. And the kids were brought together. But sometimes it's happened to all of us. We're brought together with another child, but we might not necessarily like the other child. The adults want us to like them, but we mightn't like them. So they both found friendships, Michael with Joe and Edward in a way. Uh, his friendship wasn't as close, but he was more aligned, we'd say, to Richie. So that's just the way that that worked out, you know? And I think it's the way, there's no mystery really to it. It's just the way I write, Leo. I, I mean, I, I, I decide on a character, and in this case, the characters happen to be we in Edward and Joe Hopper. And I just try to get into their head and put a camera inside their head and see only what they see and hear only what they see, as if I'm making a movie. And that way, things unroll at their own pace like of a Russian movie, they unroll at their own pace. And that's just the way I've always written. And um, I visualize and I listen to what I write. They're like, that's just the way I do it, you know? You know, I, I was speaking with Miranda about this earlier today. I just, I gave her a call and we were talking about logistics. And I, and I told her that as an art historian, it almost feels like a faux pas to say to a painter, how, how did you do that? How long did that take you? <laughs> But when I hear that you worked on this for six years, and she, yes. she, she reassured me that, that I would not be insulting in speaking with not you. Not at all, not But uh, it, uh, let me ask you a question. Th there's a fine list of other volumes. I'm actually gonna read Taddy next, I mm. decided. But I wanna know, given, and, 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 I, and, I, and I wanna speak with you about some other, if it's okay, some other, Autobi maybe not autobiographical, but some personal resonance you might feel mm. with certain characters. But I'm curious, understanding that you had your own set of um, challenges during that six year span, have you ever spent that long writing a book before? Or is that- oh, Yeah, I, I wrote a book called Last Train from Liguria, which is set in Mussolini's era in Italy. And 
one of the characters actually is a little Jewish boy. And originally, I, I had considered making Michael a little Jewish boy, but I thought it would be more interesting to have him coming from the other side, you know. But yeah, I did spend as long doing that. When you're, when you're trying to get to fit your life, your imagined world into a history that has happened, that is real, it takes quite a while to do it. And I am quite methodical. I'm a bit like a method at actor, say. I'm sort of like a method writer in a way in that I have to become each one of those characters. But I have to become each one of those characters in the, whatever role they take within that world, a world that no longer exists, but that we are all aware of. So that's where my challenges lie. Um, and sometimes out of, um, you know, out of, out of, you, you get luck when you're least expecting it. For example, I was really quite ill after the, the kidney operation. And, and yet, reading about Edward Topper and reading about how ill he was that summer of 1950, um, it, it, it helped me to write about him, you know? And just little things, the gods send you things sometimes, I think, and you just get on with it. And I had to try and become him, and not just him, but Michael and Richie, but Edward Hopper was the one that I found myself that I could relate to easiest. Um, and I tried to get to know him. He was the most difficult to get to know in some ways, but in other ways, I just felt that he was easier to enter. His mind was easier to enter. And I mean, I did everything I could to do that um, by reading what he would read that summer. I even painted Cape Cod Morning with great difficulty. And then I got a professional artist to, teach, to, to go through how did he do it. Like you said, you feel you, you can't ask somebody how did they paint this. And this, she's a quite very accomplished Italian um, artist. And she said to me, well, you know, you know when you're doing the, um, where is it? I forgot one. the lines that of the, of the um, I have it here somewhere. You know those little, uh, what do you call them over there? The boards on the side of the, the white, planks on the side of the, the window in Cape Cod morning. Right, let's see here, this. You know, these, these kind of, what are they called again? Flats. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> but anyway, you know, you, you look at them and you think, oh yeah, they'd be easy to do, but they're not. He has his own geometrical instinct that just needs to fit into you know, it, it, it belies any rulers or any kind of technique you can come come to. But anyway, I am, um, I, uh, you know, so whatever I have to do to be to to get close to the character, I will do. And you're talking about that book, Tatty. Tatty is a book told. It's about a child telling you the story of a marriage breakup because of alcoholism, and it's episodic. And every year, every chapter, she's a year older. So when I was doing that, I used to have to stoop down like a five-year-old looking at the world from that angle. And then I'd make myself taller each time. And wow. so that's the way I work. It's just the way I work. Well, your research took you to Cape Cod not once, but twice, correct? Yes, yeah. Twice wow. it took me there. I mean, you know, I had bought all of these books online. Uh, the Floor and Fauna of Cape Cod, The Sky at Night of Cape Cod. This, you know, I spent a fortune ages reading them and really there's nothing to be boots on the ground if you'd excuse the expression so i found um a house on uh, airbnb one other house uh on fisher's beach which is the same beach right ages the expensive house but the owner was very very good and she let me um she she told me to make her an offer and i made her an offer and uh, she reduced greatly reduced the um the, the asking price and so myself and my husband went there. And I nearly died when I saw the house. It was so beautiful. It was a huge house with a grand piano. And I had imagined a little cottage like Edward and Joe's cottage, but this was a huge house. But what it allowed me to do was to experience the light, the beach, the sea, the movements of the sea, to, to, as they would have done. And also because it's changed so little, with the exception of a house that's been built here and there, um, I could really imagine my way into those, the, the little side roads and the, you know, the wildlife, all that sort of stuff. And um, I couldn't get anybody to 
allow me to have access into the Hopper house. So I'm afraid I have to confess that um, I did a little light trespassing and talked my husband into doing a little light trespassing. We didn't get into the house, but we, we got this invisible dog, which always got lost while we got near the house. So we were able to chase the dog. Nobody was around anyway, but just in case. But I walked up that little, I walked up through, through that hill, you know, the one you've, you've seen it, that goes from the beach up to the house. I went from the garage up the steps where Mike and has his accent accident i sat in the the seat where hopper would have sat and i sat behind where her little seat, seated place was and i was able to imagine my way into that and then the library when i went to the library they happened to have photographs of the interior of the house just after um the new people had uh, inherited it and gave me that so i was able to do that too i took pictures of it so you know so it was handy i, I took pictures of yeah, you know what I'm talking about, yeah. yeah. I'm talking about. It's really interesting, you know, two things I want to say. First, as an aside, you know, everyone knows that Hopper was good at fixing things and making paper models and mm. making a model at, mm. at one point. But what I love, and I thought of this when you mentioned the accident that Michael had, mm. chickening out and run, running away, and he yeah. tripped you have Hopper fixing a wound as methodically mm. as he prepares gesso on a canvas. And, yes. it, and it's really nice. Another thing that, that happens a lot, um, and, I'm, and I'm glad be, because you were there, you obviously understood that there's the beach down here, but mm. all the houses are at various points on the hill, perhaps, I don't know, 10, 20, in some cases, 30 or 40 point feet higher. And you made me realize every time you have the boys running up the hill and down, that there's almost like surveillance that the hoppers mm. can see who's on their beach. Was yeah. that by design? No, but when I saw the way the, the house was on the beach was, and when I sat there looking out, I realized that they could do that. And wow. I were quite protective and looked upon it as their beach right. and uh, she did in particular so I just I, I could not use it I felt you know and also you know given the fact that he had diverticulitis and was unwell that year and his doctor had told him that you know standing in cold seawater is not good for it and he loved swimming and he loved the water I was able to kind of play on that idea of this is something else now I'm going to have to give up. And the tiredness of making his way back up the hill when he's not feeling well and when he's a little depressed because he can't work, you know, that all fed into it in a second, which wouldn't have happened if I wasn't there. Christine, Aidan Rooney just, just chimed in and said clapboards. That's what we're looking for. Not clapboards, that's it. Yes. Uh, you know. Thank you. <laughs> PhD in art history, B. Dan. I know, I have, it, I have it mentioned in the book, I don't know, many times, sorry. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's some interest. We spoke about this and you said this wasn't by design, but you, you have some, some of your finest writing, I feel, is in the exp expository sort of descriptive analysis of architecture. You may not use architectural, you know, architectural history vocabulary, but you, at one point, uh, like about three quarters of the way in, describing Michael's um, feeling proud of himself, I think this is right after he tells off uh, Peter and Marty. I think he tells them to go oh, F yeah. himself. Yeah. F themselves, which is great, which is so great. <laughs> um, and I have to remember, yeah, people used that word in 1950. <laughs> you said he was just feeling so just, I don't know, in love with the hopper, but also with that house. And you said he wants to wrap, to wrap his arms around the house. And I, and, I, and I feel that architecture is almost like a, a character, a plot determinant in some place. Yeah. You know, the Kaplan's house sounds like just, a very, very snotty, uptight place. <laughs> you know? 
Unlike the Hopper's house. Yeah, unlike the Hopper's house. The Hopper's house is more fun. Yeah, I know. And it's a house with no men, which is something that I hadn't realized until somebody pointed out to me. Because sometimes you write books and you don't realize things are in it, which work, but you, you, you weren't aware that you put, put them in. But somebody said to me that the only person with a man is Joe Hopper in the whole story. That, you know, there's men on the outskirts and even the flowery housewives that she, she couldn't stand. We don't see their husbands. You know, there's, there's, there's no men around and there's no men in that house. Mrs. Kaplan does her own thing. Her husband is dead. Olivia's husband, Richie's, Richie's father is dead. And then the friend, the freeloading friend is, hasn't got anybody. So there's really nobody in the house. Right. And um, yeah. they have that little, it's uptight because of Olivia, I think. Right. Yeah, she's got a problem. Well, Olivia, yeah. Olivia, a, a not very lovable character by the end. But <laughs> uh, what, can you show, can you show the group um, the painting, the woman in the door well, and talk a little bit about the Catherine? character okay now this is to say what can i say now? i have it there a minute oh yeah i used three paintings right two that were paint used uh, painted in 1950 and one that was painted in 1949 which is this one high noon okay can you see that and um i just thought it was a very interesting painting when i looked at it and I read the, in Joe's diary how she posed for it. And I was kind of thinking, well, she's five foot and this woman, you know, this woman nearly, it's so tall, she's nearly at the top of the door. Right. So, oh, why, did, why did he add on another foot onto her? And um, I be, kind of became intrigued with the idea of these women that appeared in his paintings that were usually quite tall and could be quite buxom, whereas Joe was tiny and bird-like. And um, who, why, why did he not just paint the, his model as she was, which was his wife? Why did he change? Why did he change it? And um, anyway, I hadn't got the character of Catherine at that point, uh, but um, I was in Montreal and I decided to go to um, a concert, myself and my husband on a winter's evening. Um, I don't know if you've ever been in Montreal in the winter, in Canada in the winter, and it's so bleak and there's nobody around and you keep expecting snipers to appear on the rooftops and it's really scary. But anyway, we went into this, to the, um, to the concert hall and it was the Planet Suite by Gustav Holtz. And as it began to play the bringer of war, that very, very strong opening movement, I thought, God, that's just like Joe Hopper. Everywhere she goes, she, she causes a row. You know, she's seems to fight with everybody, particularly other females. And, uh, and then I thought, it's also like Michael. He comes from Germany and he brings the war with him. And, um, and then the movement of Venus, which is a completely different, emotionally it's completely different, it sounds completely different. And I saw Catherine, I suddenly saw her. And I saw her as somebody who was tall and sick looking and pale and sort of ill. And I was recovering from my own illness at the time, but Catherine will be different to me because she is, she's beautiful. And she's also not the same kind of person. I don't want anyone thinking I thought I was Catherine because I do make that quite clear. And shortly after I got back from Canada, I went to see my specialist and he said to me, you know, you're very lucky. Um, if you're a very lucky girl, because that's the way Irish doctors always talk to women, you're a very lucky girl. If this had been in the 1950s, we would have had to break your ribs with a hammer to take your kidney out, and you probably would have died. And something went ping in my head, and I thought, that's what I'll give her. I will give her cancer of the kidney. I will make use of my illness that I've gone through, and I will give it to her. And the two boys are kind of fascinated with the idea that her... her you know, her ribs were broken with the hammer. You know, the way little boys like these kind of gory details. So that's how Catherine came about. And um, she becomes a fascination for him, but he, he, he's never going to do anything about it. You know, he's not like other artists. He says at one point in the book, if I was Picasso, one of those other guys, 
I might do this, or I might, but he's not one of these, those guys. So um, I, that, that's really how she, how she came about. And I also, there was a kind of a thought in my head that when Edward Hopper was a young man, he went, went to Paris a couple of times and there was a woman in his life, a married woman. And he covered his tracks very well because I couldn't, I don't know about you, you may know more than I do about her, but um, there are paintings of, early paintings of a, a naked woman over the sewing machine, or a woman in, in a little flimsy thing over a sewing machine, another naked one sitting on the floor, half naked. And she appears a few times and I seem to imagine that I could see her face appearing in other later paintings as if he didn't forget her, you know? That could be me romanticizing, of course, but they are all tied into Catherine. You know, um, it's interesting. Um, the word romance and romanticizing obviously has many connotations. You yeah. unromanticized Hopper by, I don't know, just not, you demystified him. You allowed Hopper to be a sexual being, not acting on it. I mean, I want to be clear there. <laughs> but, but, but <laughs> no. there you, 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 you make, you allow Hopper, you allow the artist, um, and you allow Joe as well to have desire and to let the and you show them you walk you walk the reader through their in, engagement with physical longing yes yeah a yearning yeah right. i think i think joe um physically loved her husband very much that she was very attracted to him physically and I imagine, and I, and I think I did see this, or I read it in, in her diary or something. She puts it very in a very um, discreet way, but reading between the lines anyway, um, that in 1950, because he was suffering from diverticulitis, that he may not, it was painful for him to have sex. So that part of their life, she referred to it several times. Well, I guess that part of my life is over now. You know, she said that a few times. And it seemed with regret, with great regret. So I, I do think that she desired her husband. I mean, he was an attractive man. And he did, I think, um, women looked at him. And I think she did. She certainly did look at him in a, in a, in a way that um, she regretted not, not that, that their physical side of their life was put on hold. I don't know whether they ever, I only concentrated on 1950, on that year, for different reasons. Sure. But, um, I don't know whether they heard from that or not. Right. Mm. Well, you know, I realized that. I mean, the to the extent that the that the book's about someone or something, I, I realized that Michael and Joe Hopper kind of compete for our attention in some ways. But <laughs> I. An aspect of Joe that I had not considered before this was Joe as an ethical being. And, you know, the it's kind of a climax scene in the book. Well, there, there are other such scenes, but the whole thing when the little lair, the hideout that Michael had made for himself. And, you know, maybe that was a healthy, important thing for him to do as someone who had seen awful, awful things mm. in the war. But he also, if there's such a thing as innocent thieves, well, Joe, for, I, I don't know, I, I hate to give spoiler alerts here, you know, to spoil the book, but um, I'll just come out and say, and you might want to cover your ears or put me on mute. Um, there's a party that it takes a while for us to really realize this is actually a fundraiser for the or orphanage program and the money's missing and having seen that michael takes i don't know pens and pocket knives and candy bars and steals them and leaves his things in his little fort his getaway everyone assumes that he that he stole this. He didn't. We find out it's Richie. But you are, you have Joe very quick to point out. Although we know that, as you said, Edward and Richie, Joe and Michael, I get that. But even in that binary, 
you go to uh, Joe schooling. I mean, stealing is stealing, she says. You have Joe as a very ethical, almost judicial-like being. Well, I think she was a bit. I think she probably was a bit. Um, and also, at that point, a lot has happened. The party has happened. Yeah. She's felt let down. And I actually think she just wants Edward back to all to herself. And she no longer wants Michael. She just doesn't want him. She's, he's going to go now. She just sees the end of something. And because it, it always has been herself and Edward and it will continue to be herself and Edward. As they, you know, in Cape Cod and when they go back and they climb those 72 or 74 stairs up to, the, up to the, their studio in Washington Square, it's just going to be them. But she doesn't, she no longer wants to be part of the, the life that the Kaplan, Kaplan family offer. She's sickened by the whole thing. She's had enough of Michael, I think, at this point. Maybe, maybe. I think we've all had enough of the Kaplans and all this drama by, by the very end. You know, it's just kind of like... Yeah. I mean, I, I totally get I totally get that. Um, I, I also... I can't help but wonder, you know, you, you don't really say a lot about... You don't mention the Holocaust, per se. You don't mention... You barely really mention the war it's directly. However, there's a social history element running throughout this. Mm. And you know, yeah. And that's, and that's one of the very believable things because so much of the Hopper literature has has dealt with Hopper as somehow detached from social history. And um, the Hoppers, the Hoppers that you present show them extraordinarily sensitive to what has just happened in the last decade. Yes, yeah, I think so. I mean, and we must remember too that he was even um, an air raid warden at one point and he'd get up in the middle of the night and go out with his torch when they were with fear that America could be, um, could be invaded. But I also think it was a very, a very interesting and strange time in American history, 1950, when suddenly America seemed to get the, the, the standard of living was shooting up. You know, the, I found these these little pamphlets that were great use to me in um, in a tiny shop in Provincetown, and when you and it gives the cost of living from say 1947 up, and from 1948 down to 49 to 50, a huge jump in the cost of living. And yet the cost of a car and <laughs> didn't go up so much. So America was well off and. Also, where women were concerned, they were, um, you know, they had had a certain amount of independence while the men were away at war and they were working and earning their own money. And now suddenly the men were coming back and not all coming back healthy, either mentally or, or physically. And uh, the women were expected now to go back into the kitchen. So they began to glamorize the idea of the American housewife. And it's heavily marketed. It's really heavily marketed in these books that I got. And you see, you know, she has her little penny, the frilly penny on and the little waist and the honey, I'm home. And he's on the station wagon in the, in the, in the, front, in the front of the house. And it's an ideal life because it's, it's, it's supposed to be an ideal life. But yet a lot of the women who bought into it, who had to buy into it, found themselves frustrated and found that something, they'd given away something. They'd given away an independence that only for the war they may never have had experienced. So I thought that was good. It gave a lot of tension, underlying tension. And um, I feel Edward Hopper kind of got that in his own way and was more, I don't know. I just think he's, he was somebody who, who had a big, vast interior life and was comfortable with himself, I think. And probably could have- Precisely the minute that a lot of Americans are not comfortable with themselves. Yeah. Yeah, 1950 is such an interesting. I, I just cut you off. I'm sorry. Please go. Oh, ahead. you're right. Though. I mean, and then the Korean. They're just getting over the war, and then the Korean War just suddenly arrives, and it's going to start all over again. And most civilians wouldn't have even seen it coming until they heard, you know. And anyway, I just thought I just that's why I picked 1950. Really, I wasn't sure which year to pick. Well, you do a you do an outstanding job of of capturing what 
perhaps an awkward transition time this is. You know, this is, it's, it's not quite the I like Ike white picket fence, Ozzy and Harriet era, but nor is it World War II. Yeah. And yeah. it's in America, it's a world very much in tra transition. And um, I, at this time, I, I guess I'd like to turn it over to Mir Miranda. Um, I, I want to, first of all, thank you, Christine, very much. Thank you, Leo. It's always talk to you. For, yeah, I, I, I just, this is one of the best books I've read in a very long time. And um, it's renewed my hope for the possibilities for historical fi fiction, which is not baseless hyperbole to say. It's for those of you who haven't read it, um, you won't regret getting this volume. Um, That's a relief, so Leo. It's an, it's an absolute relief to hear you saying that because when I heard it was yourself, and all your knowledge about art, I was thinking, oh God, I'm in trouble now. So it's such a relief. That you oh, I, I, I wish, I, as I think I told you when we spoke that I wish I had read this before I, you know, I wish it had come out a few years early, but I know the gestation period was long, time, but I want to turn it over to Miranda. Okay, thanks. Do you feel any questions or to ask one or two yourself if sure. you have any? Thank you, yeah. Um, well, first of all, thank you so much, both of you. Um, I could I could certainly keep listening to both of you talk, and it's just such a fascinating place. I think the space that you both have found today between, um, you know, like you say, um, Christine, uh, and I, I like I was talking to Leo about this earlier. Like I definitely felt kind of excited about the possibility of finding this kind of space between. Um, you know, a curator who's done a huge amount of research about the artist and has come at it from, you know, a very different perspective. And then a novelist who's essentially using this character as a as a kind of starting point for um, for a, a piece of fiction. Um, so I was also a bit nervous about that because um, and, and that kind of leads me to my question. You say, you know, you started the book with Michael as a central character and then you um, you said something really beautifully about um, to me about the way that Edward and Joe Hopper kind of forced their way into being a more central central characters. Um, and at that point, I suppose, I'm not sure if that's when you realized, OK, now I'm writing a, an historical fiction. <laughs> and so that <laughs> must have drastically uh, altered your whole research process and like the amount of time that potentially it take. I mean, I know any novel takes a huge amount of research. Um, yeah. But, you know, you're talking then about real characters. And I, I'm curious about what the process was around research, because, you know, you mentioned the diaries and obviously the work um, and you read a lot and you went to the space you went to, the, to Cape Cod but you must have talked to a lot of people as well and I'm curious about what their um what they thought you were doing and and did you meet any kind of resistance around that because I'm 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 imagining that you know you're meeting a lot of people who are experts in Hopper um and you're coming at it from a completely different direction so I was just curious about about that, the process, both during the process and even after it was published, did you feel any different about this novel in comparison to another one? Is there, is it more nerve wracking when you think if somebody's going to pipe up and say, no, that was wrong? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> I totally right. <laughs> you didn't. <laughs> but first of all, if I can, if I may correct you, Miranda, mm. the, the, the feel of this novel was they weren't my characters. I didn't make them up. They existed. Okay. So I didn't go out then and sort of consult um, art experts or, any, or anything. What I just really wanted to do was to see what it would be like to be Edward Hopper or Joe Hopper and to mm. see what it would be like to put them in that location in that year. And that's, that's just, I don't think beyond that really. When I was in Cape Cod, I wanted the landscape, I wanted the location. I, I'm a filmmaker, if you like, even though it's, I'm going to write it down. I get my location, I audition the different characters around and I find what year it's going to be in. And then I lower the characters down into the location and see what happens. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know, I was, I was scared about them because they were real and I probably didn't want to have too much scholarly information because I was afraid they'd put me off. One of the reasons that I called them Mr. and Mrs. H and I didn't ever use the word hopper was because I was daunted by their, if I, I knew if I kept saying, well, here's, Mr. here's Edward Hopper coming now and here's Joe Hopper, 
using their names, that I would be petrified and it would take the natural run of things away. So that was just a decision I made. And the people that I spoke to, I had some great help from um, unusual sources, I think. There was a woman who, there is a woman who owns a very nice art gallery in Orleans where the, one of the paintings I use is painted, uh, um, was painted. I dropped into her and spoke to her and she was very nice and she was great help to me. And she introduced me to a man called Alec Marshall and his wife, Anne. And their house is actually, there's a painting by Edward Hopper called Marshall House and it's their house. They're quite elderly now, really nice couple. So just to even listen to him talk and him to tell us how much Cape Cod had changed since he went there when he was a boy and all that kind of thing. And there are little bits that give you flavor and give you an idea about where you're going. But the bottom line is you just get you sit at your thing, you, you, you turn yourself off. And bear in mind, Miranda, when I started to write this book, I had a wonderful freedom in a way because I said to myself, and this sounds very melodramatic now in hindsight, but I said to myself, you might not get to finish this book. Mm, wow. so you use it day by day to put in yeah. the act. You don't think about the future. And that's what I did. Amazing, yeah. And that's what I did. And that's why I didn't think. And suddenly it was finished. Wow. And so you didn't have anyone saying you need to get this right. Like, as in, you need to, you need to know this about the hoppers or anything like that. Like, I'm just- I'm no, I mean, I read it. a lot. I knew myself when I, what I needed to know and I read a lot and I tried not to completely make up something that I could be pulled up on. Yeah. Um, some people had thought that <clears throat> I should have Edward having sex with Catherine in it, but I knew that would happen. I just knew he wouldn't have been the sort to have sex on the beach with yeah. Catherine. So I, I just didn't do it. So you know, people wanted the story to go a different way, but that's different to how, yeah. you know, different question. And um, I just let it grow day by day without thinking about it too much. Yeah. You know, yeah. and it's just the way I work. You know, I have things that becomes part of my life. Like you probably see here behind me, maps and things yeah. like that. This is the new novel now. And when this is finished, this will be like the, the detective room in a police station. There'll be <laughs> things all over the place bits of things on the floor and this this is me building my little mm, literature around me yeah creating the characters and, yeah. and um so actually there's a couple of comments from colette breen so the first one is a comment kudos christine language so authentic in terms of american english hard to believe that an irish writer could get it so right actually that struck me as well when i was writing it i, I loved that was I loved a big that. fear yeah that was my yeah. big fear that it might yeah. be stage Irish it'd be stage American yeah yeah <laughs> no, I, I mean I have to ask an American to comment on that but I think uh, I would certainly yeah. agree and then the other question from Colette and maybe you can comment on that the, the other question from Colette is as in Tati the innocence of children vies with the vitriol of adults do you see this as a, a recurring theme in this book with the intensity of the Hopper's relationship especially Joe's anger yeah, probably. I mean, I think when you when we write novels, um, or any or short stories or whatever, that there's a little part of it, part of us in each character, and there is a little bit of, of me and Michael and Richie and Anne and Joe and um, and Ed, and Edward, and I think one of my strengths, if I can say, as a, in all modesty, as a writer, is the ability to get into a child's to to because I remember my childhood very well. Um, probably because it was lived on red alert. I was always waiting for the next argument, the next row, the next blow up with my parents. And, um, and, and that is something that makes, it's something in common. A lot of writers have it in common. It's a very, it's a very common thing in, within writers. Um, that and the illness in adolescence where you spend more time in your head. So I think adults don't realize that children are listening to everything and they're taking up everything and they will remember everything especially the more horrific it is the more they will remember it you know yeah so yeah, yeah. um anything else that that's in terms of the questions i don't know if leo you want to chime in on on any of that um i i'm uh I, I'm very curious about what's in back of you, and I, and I look forward to seeing what that. Yeah, it's like. all London. It's all London now, so I have to. You know, it's so difficult to get different accents. We are, I suppose, at an advantage in that we see so much American TV and now English TV. 
that you do get the accents. That is a help, I suppose, over the years. But mine is all about London now and trumpet playing and boxing and all that so kind is of this, thing. Have you just started? This is a very kind of early research. I started at about 80 pages done okay. now at this point, yeah. Okay, well, that's uh, that's something I... My father was a novelist and I, I was... I was absolutely forbidden from asking him what was it about while while uh, he was in the process of it, and he always said, "Never ask a writer what they're." What oh, they're I never they're mind. <laughs> so I never mind. It's only sometimes that when you start explaining what about it, sounds so shit that you don't. Want. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was a look bad look thing, maybe. He's yeah, awesome. yeah. Yeah. Um, and just to say, obviously, like, you know, anyone who hasn't read the book, like clearly Leo uh, and myself highly recommend it. Um, and, you know, you can get it from your local independent bookstore and all the usual um, places. And also, Leo, your book, um, which, by the way, I was looking at this morning, like there's these beautiful um, kind of pamphlets in the back of the book on uh, Edward Hopper and the hotels. And there is a kind of taster of Joe's um diaries as they go on these two trips in 1941 and 1952 to 53 um so you kind of you get a it's lovely it was actually lovely it was reading these this morning having read your book of course christine um and they just they kind of speak to each other really nicely like they're yeah something. when i was talking to leo about edward hopper i it sounded all very familiar to me having read a novel which i just thought was such an interesting kind of way in and yeah. um, but leo the book i presume we can get from the museum if anybody's looking for it uh, you get it from the museum. It's dis distributed by Yale University Press, and um, yeah, they're they they have cop copies. Okay, okay. perfect. <laughs> Thank you so much. Well, look, um, we'll leave you to uh, go about your Sunday afternoon and your Sunday evening, respectively. Thank you so much uh, for for giving us both both of you giving us your time on a Sunday, and um, it's just been a real joy listening to both of you. And I thank you so much um, to both of you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Leo. Thank, thank you, Christine. Thank you, Thanks, and everybody back for a lot, us. all of you. Appreciate it. Take care. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, everybody. Bye. 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 Bye.